to see everyone, dear Beckenstein family, our speaker Wald, uh, Professor Robert Wald, and dear institute members and all uh, participants. Um, it is already the fifth uh, Beckenstein lecture in fundamental physics, a tradition that was initiated uh, under the leadership of former head of institute uh, Baruch Meyerson. And, uh, and through a committee that was established at the time. And uh, it's already uh, five years that we meet to remember uh, Jacob Beckenstein and the discoverer of the theoretical notion of black hole entropy, on which we will hear much more in, in the talk, so I will not elaborate. And uh, to, uh, to, to remember, well, he, he left us too early and unexpectedly, but also to celebrate, to celebrate science, to celebrate life, and uh, we have a wonderful speaker with us today uh, that I'm sure uh, will take us in that direction. Uh, I would like, as an introduction, uh, to tell you a little bit about Jacob Beckenstein, and then I will introduce the speaker. Uh, Oh, by the way, it's a theoretical notion, black hole entropy, but it's now being attempted to confirm experimentally, not in black holes, but in analog systems. So there is a lab of Jeff Steinhauer in the Technion, and he has an analog, analogous system to a black hole where he uh, is attempting to prove this experimentally. So this would be uh, wonderful if such a thing happened. So uh, some biographical uh, information about uh, late Jacob. He was born in 1947 in Mexico City. He's not really a Mexican. His uh, parents emigrated from uh, Eastern Europe a few years earlier. And then uh, he moved to the States uh, during high school, first to Texas, but he's not really a Texan, then to New York. And in New York, uh, he finished high school. He, he did his undergraduate uh, in the Polytechnic of Brooklyn, and then he went on to Princeton, uh, where as a graduate student doing his PhD under John Wheeler, he discovered black hole entropy in 1972, and our speaker, Bob Wald, was uh, his contemporary, uh, his uh, friend to, uh, to the PhD school in Princeton. Uh, it became a basis of a whole field in fundamental physics known as black hole thermodynamics, which is exactly the title of the talk today. Uh, his uh, discoveries are known throughout the world, and they were recognized by numerous prizes, the 2005 Israel Prize, the 2012 Wolf Prize. We have here a new volume, commemorative vo volume of Jacob, where you see him at the Wolf Prize in the Knesset with the Chagall uh, picture behind him. Uh, and the 2015 Einstein Prize given by the American Physical Society. And most of you know he was a professor here at the Raqqa Institute since 1990 and until he passed away in, 19, in 2015. Uh, for me, he was a model scientist, a scientist to look up to. Uh, always intellectually and personally honest, uh, always committed to 
truth, I would say, with a capital T, and always independent and original. And uh, I would like to conclude this part by telling you in, uh, about, in his words, uh, telling you about his teachers during his PhD, out of his scientific autobiography, which is called Of Gravity, Black Holes, and Information. And uh, here is one nice story. So, <clears throat> in Princeton, there was a year-long course on general relativity. The first semester was taught by Charles Misner. Those of you who know the big Apple book, Misner, Thorne, Wheeler, so that's the same Misner, who was then visiting Princeton from the University of Maryland. He taught the basics. In the second semester, John Archibald Wheeler, of whom I will have a lot to say, developed the applications, neutron stars, black holes, and relativistic cosmology. Wheeler was the PhD advisor of Feynman many years ago, and also the PhD advisor of both Bekenstein and Wall. And he was really a person that put GR, general relativity, Einstein's gravity, back on the map, back as a central topic in physics. Uh, so it was uh, Princeton at the time, and this group were really a focal point that out of which a lot of general relativity came from. So all this was very exciting and made me the more resolute to do my thesis on gravitation. I got another view of cosmology from a course by James Peebles, then a young faculty and one of the big names in cosmology today. He could be quite funny in his lectures and yet passed on to us a great amount of insight into the universe and its evolution. The lectures were so enthralling that I was glad to see them appear as a book by Peebles some years later. Peebles has since authored two other books on cosmology, but to my mind, these sequels lack the atmosphere of excitement that pervades that first one. This year, we may add that Peebles is also the recipient of, I believe, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. And so this is one story about the teachers, then Princeton, and a few words about the language requirement. In Princeton's graduate school, one also had to show language proficiency by passing oral exams in two languages, French, German, or Russian. And then he says he passed the German because he knew some Yiddish. And then in, in, in brackets, he says, my wife and I use it today for jokes and to keep secrets from the children. <laughs> okay? And then he says that he flunked French twice, and he's not sure how he got his PhD. And it's not surprising that he flunked it twice because he never studied it. He just assumed he was able to read it because it was a science paper. So he went on and tried to read it and didn't succeed. So, uh, so before introducing the speaker, I would like to mention the contributions. Well, I already mentioned Bob of Mayerson. I should mention also uh, Ofer Biam, former head of institute, who uh, was the guy who was really a uh, behind a 2012 meeting, 40 years of thermodynamics that I will mention shortly. And also, he was maybe the spirit behind or pushing behind the Wolf Prize at the time. And I also want to thank Etia Deel, the institute administrator, if she's still here, that would be even nicer, who was always very supportive uh, of this lecture series and contributed to them. Okay, so now I want to go on or to change and to introduce uh, our uh, speaker today. He's well known to researchers on Einstein's gravity uh, or general relativity uh, uh, because due to his popular 1984 textbook and he's well known as a researcher in the field and he won the Einstein Prize, the same prize that Jacob won in 2015, he won in 2017. Uh, I will give you a bit uh, outline of his scientific biography. Uh, in 68, he obtained his undergraduate degree from Columbia University. In 72, the same year as, Beco as Beckenstein, he obtained his PhD. You see uh, some parallels together with Anro, who was the third Beckenstein speaker. Uh, he's been faculty at the University of Chicago since 1976. Uh, there's an important group there since the tradition of Chandra Sekar and Gerosh. Uh, in 1977, he already wrote a book, a popular science book called Space, Time, and Gravity. Then in 84, he wrote this well-known uh, textbook in Einstein Gravity that I already mentioned. In 93, he introduced the world entropy, 
You may ask me, what is the word entropy? It's a black hole entropy. So black hole entropy was actually invented by Jacob. So why is this the world entropy? Because this is a generalization of Bekenstein entropy to generalize theories of gravity. You need to find a different expression for the entropy, and Wald's formula gives you the expression for the entropy of black holes in those cases. In 1994, I want to mention that he won a graduate teaching award from the, Chicago, from the University of Chicago. In 1996, he made another very well-known uh, scientific achievement, uh, the regularization of the self-force in extreme mass ratio, binary in spiral. So motion of two black holes, extreme mass ratio, these are really sources for gravitational waves, and uh, there is an issue of regularization there, a deep issue that was resolved then. There was another group doing it at the same time. In 97, he wrote a review, Black Hole Thermodynamics, okay? Exactly the same subject, uh, the Jacob and the title of our talk today. In 2012, he participated in the Hebrew University workshop that I mentioned, 40 years of Black Hole Thermodynamics. The Wolf Prize was awarded the same year to Jacob. Uh, he wrote over 150 research papers. Uh, and the citation for his Einstein Prize re reads, the, for the discovery of general formula for black hole entropy, the world entropy, and for developing a rigorous formulation of quantum field theory in curved space-time. So I brought my own copies of the book. Here is the textbook, okay, it's being used. And here is an, the second book on quantum field theory in curved space-time. He also had a special uh, relation with Jacob. Uh, we mentioned that they went to graduate school together, and had the common field of science, black hole thermodynamics, and he participated in the meeting. But also, he was the one who wrote the Physics Today obituary in 2015 for Bekenstein, and also contributed to the uh, commemorative volume uh, on Bekenstein, I think it was a year or two ago. Uh, this volume was edited by Brink, Muhanov, who was the second Bekenstein speaker, Rabinovich, our own Eliezer Rabinovich, and Fua. So after this long introduction, please join me in a warm welcome to our speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see if this microphone is, how is that adjustment? Sounds good? Okay, hope that keeps up. All right, I wanted to before get, just say a couple of words, uh, mention, although this has already been covered uh, with Barack's quite nice introduction, but we were, uh, Jacob and I were graduate students at exactly the same time uh, in Princeton. We both, uh, we both received our uh, PhD degrees in the same year, 1972, and, we're competing in the job market for postdocs. Uh, we talked on a nearly daily basis because our uh, strong interests were in black hole physics. And indeed, it was at exactly this time that Jacob initiated the ideas about black hole entropy, which formed the basis and really initiated the entire subject of black hole thermodynamics, and black hole thermodynamics is what I will be talking about in the rest of the talk uh, today. But first, I want to just begin by telling people, especially those not, uh, not expert general relativists, a little bit about what a black hole is. Uh, then I'll discuss a little bit about black holes in nature, and then we'll get on to the theory of black holes and the relationship with thermodynamics. So a black hole is simply a region where gravity is so strong that anything that enters that region can never escape from it. And the anything that enters that region includes light. So any light that's within a black hole can never escape to the outside, and therefore black holes will appear to be black. Now, black holes are normally talked about as exotic ideas that come from general relativity, 
But a lot, not all, but a lot of the basic idea of a black hole goes back more than 200 years to Mitchell and Laplace. Uh, what these authors did was the calculation that one does in high school or freshman physics now of the escape velocity of a particle, a body from the surface of a planet or a star of mass m and radius r. And what they noted is if the radius of the body uh, was sufficiently small compared to its mass, less than what we now call the Schwarzschild radius of the body, which would only be three kilometers uh, for the sun. Uh, but if you had a very massive body, then the density would not have to be so high uh, to be, for the body to be within a Schwarzschild radius. Uh, then the escape velocity would be bigger than the velocity of light. So they predicted that there should be stars. They didn't know what the masses of them would be, uh, et cetera. The, uh, so, uh, the, wouldn't have known how realistic this is, but there should be stars that are, are within their Schwarzschild radius and there should, therefore should appear to be dark, uh, no light being emitted from the surface or the light emitted would fall back. Now, there's one big change in this picture due to general relativity, uh, and that you can really think of as being due to the fact that in relativity, nothing can travel faster than light. So if in some sense, light is gonna be pulled back in in this region of no escape, everything else is also gonna be pulled back in. And the corresponding statement in general relativity to what Mitchell and Laplace found is if you have a body that is sufficiently compacted by exactly the same formula that Mitchell and Laplace had using, uh, obtained using Newtonian gravity, such a body can't exist in equilibrium. It'll have to undergo complete gravitational collapse to a singularity. I'll explain this or show you this in more detail uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, now, uh, one of the most interesting and uh, still unresolved issues is whether, you know, the nature of the singularity and uh, particularly what surrounds it, but there is considerable emphasis, uh, <coughs> excuse me, considerable evidence, uh, mainly by indirect arguments, but there is considerable evidence in favor of what's called the cosmic censorship conjecture, which says that this singularity produced in gravitational collapse of a body is always going to be surrounded by a region of no escape. That is, the singularity will always be hidden within a black hole. So the end product of collapse is believed to be always a black hole, and I will assume that, and that is an assumption made by res all researchers basically in, or in gravitational physics, but it is, it is something that hasn't been proven yet in complete generality in general relativity. So I won't say anything more about cosmic censorship in this talk, but I will assume that it's true and that one always gets a black hole. So I'm gonna explain more about what a black hole is and then go on to black hole thermodynamics, but I thought it would be good to say a few words, even though the focus of this talk is on the theory of black holes, to say a little bit about the formation of black holes in nature in the real universe. And there are three basic mechanisms that, uh, well, we have reason, good reason to believe, well, can result in black holes and for two of them, do result in black holes. Uh, by far the best understood one is the collapse of sufficiently massive stars. Uh, stars like the sun are being held up against collapse by high temperature, but that high temperature is being maintained by thermonuclear burning, and when stars run out of thermonuclear fuel, they will have to either collapse or be supported in a way that doesn't require high temperature. 
Now, if the mass of the star is less mass of the star after it's undergone evolution, where it may shed a lot of its initial mass, ends up being less than 1.4 solar masses, so our sun is in this category, then electron degeneracy pressure uh, is sufficient to hold up the star against gravitational collapse, and such stars will end their lives in this manner as white dwarfs. That's what will eventually happen with the sun. But if the mass is bigger than 1.4 solar masses, collapse, further collapse will have to occur. Uh, if the mass is less than about two solar masses, similar neutron degeneracy pressure and nuclear forces will be sufficient to hold a star up against gravitational collapse. So they will, this core of the star will collapse down to nuclear densities, the density of an atomic nucleus, 10 to the 14th grams per cubic centimeter uh, in particular, that's a pretty high density uh, compared to one gram per cubic centimeter of water. But such stars uh, can remain in equilibrium, and those stars are known as neutron stars, and they're commonly observed as pulsars. So they're kind of like a big atomic nucleus, a very, very big atomic nucleus, but held together by gravity rather than nuclear forces. But the Im most important point that I want to get to, that I'm getting to in this, is if the mass is sufficiently large above this neutron star limit, uh, and of course if this excess mass is not shed either during evolution or in a supernova ex explosion, then complete gravitational collapse is unavoidable and one will end up with a black hole, according to what I was saying before. You'll get a rather narrow mass range of black holes in this way. You can't make black holes less than two solar masses or so because they won't collapse. And you don't have stable stars bigger than about 100 solar masses uh, so you can't, won't produce larger black holes directly in this manner. Uh, there are about 20 uh, or so strong candidates for black holes produced in this manner seen from binary X-ray systems, but the most uh, interesting and one of the mo most exciting scientific discoveries of the last five years is that the coalescence now of black holes, and there are now, well, I think, including the, the current run, uh, the, there must be about 40 uh, such examples of black holes in binary orbits, uh, gravitational waves observed from that. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes to explain what LIGO observed, because this is certainly, as I say, one of the major scientific discoveries of the last five years or so. Uh, LIGO is two laser interferometric observatories. This is the one in Hanford. There's also one in Louisiana. And these are two four kilometer long interferometer arms. Uh, what's inside them, well, a simplified version of what's inside of them are these uh, to, here are the two four-kilometer arms. Uh, and this is really just a Michelson interferometer, similar to what's used in labs. But now the point is that if a gravitational wave is incident perpendicular to the screen, uh, it will result in oscillations of the length of these uh, arms and the distance uh, along these arms that will have the effect of contracting in one direction, well, if the polarization is correct, contracting in one direction while expanding in the other, and then over a cycle contracting in this direction and expanding in the other. So the phase difference between the beams of the, of the light can be observed and has been observed. Uh, now, if you have two objects that are coalescing, but the objects would have to be at least 
a solar mass or so to produce enough gravitational waves for LIGO to observe. And uh, well, the, most of the observations have been for two black holes that have been well, well above a solar mass. So the first one was, I mean, typically 30 solar masses, 40 solar masses are uh, now commonly observed. But what goes on is while these objects, let's say black holes, are orbiting each other, uh, they will emit gravitational radiation. As the, the orbit gets tighter, the frequency of the radiation will increase because the orbital period is decreasing. Uh, the amplitude will go up. Eventually, though, they'll merge and settle down to an equilibrium state. So a single black hole formed by the merger. So you'll get this characteristic kind of chirp behavior that uh, has a last uh, few moments where the, the frequency increases substantially, the amplitude goes up, and then you have a ring down. So amazingly, in the very first event, uh, when LIGO was first turned on, or even a day or so, in fact, before it was officially turned on, these are the signals uh, seen in Hanford and Livingston uh, matching essentially perfectly what you'd expect from coalescing black holes. And as I say, there are about 40 such examples of this now, although this remains about the best one. Uh, but black holes uh, produced in this way from stellar collapse are, uh, have definitely been observed. OK, a second process, which is presumably a distinct process, uh, can lead to massive black holes being formed at the center of galaxies. There are a variety of processes that, where perhaps you have stars disrupting each other, collecting into a supermassive object that then collapses, uh, for example, that might produce black holes of as small as 100,000 solar masses, but as large as 10 billion solar masses at the uh, center of galaxies. And essentially, all nearby galaxies where we can see the distribution of stars close enough into the center to be able to judge show evidence for the presence of a massive black hole. Uh, in particular, our own galaxy uh, has convincing evidence from orbits of stars very near the center of the black hole, uh, uh, the center of our galaxy, to have a black hole of four million solar masses, rather on the small side compared to uh, most other galaxies. Uh, massive black holes are believed to be what powers quasars. It isn't. I think well understood exactly. I mean, there are, as I say, a variety of processes that could lead to black holes. It's really not well understood exactly how they form. It's known now because we see black holes at very high, or quasar objects at very high uh, redshifts, that these black holes form extremely early. Uh, uh, and it isn't really obvious how they form so early. So I think there's interesting uh, things to be discovered. In terms of observational evidence uh, for such black holes, uh, this is certainly the most dramatic uh, evidence that was uh, produced by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, less than a year ago. Uh, this is the, an, an image uh, by the, the radio interferometer interferometers, uh, array that they uh, uh, have of the very central portion of this uh, galaxy, which is an active galactic nucleus and was presumed to have a black hole. And there was evidence from the stellar dynamics and gas dynamics that it has a black hole. But the image now, I mean, resolved at the size of the black hole shows this dark area uh, 
that's about as much of a confirmation with present technology, direct confirmation of the presence of there being a black hole at the center of this, uh, of this galaxy. Okay, finally, there's a third distinct me mechanism that can produce black holes, although there's no particular theoretical reason to believe that black holes were produced in this way and there's no observational evidence. But it's possible that black holes could have been produced by collapse of overdense regions in the very early universe. And what's interesting about this is that here you could produce uh, a mass range of almost anything, of, well, of literally anything. Uh, to explain what I mean by this, if we wanted to make a black hole, uh, if we wanted to make the Earth into a black hole, I, I don't want to and I doubt if anybody here wants to, but you have a real challenge because the black hole of the mass of the Earth is about that big. So what you'd have to do to try to make the Earth into a black hole is compress it down to, well, I don't know how big, you know, maybe this would be big enough that you compress it by, down to, at some point, self-gravity would take over and it would go the rest of the way to a black hole. But you can imagine it wouldn't be very easy to compress the Earth down to about this size, uh, okay, in the present universe. But if you, and that's why you can't make black holes in the present universe less than about two solar masses. Once you're above two solar masses, you only have to compress down to nuclear densities and gravity will do that uh, quite well on its own for such a massive star. Uh, uh, well, you'd have to compress it a bit, yeah, down to about nuclear densities if you had a sufficiently uh, massive object. If it was really, really massive, you'd only have to compress it to a low density object to make it into a, a black hole. Okay, but the point, is, the point that I'm getting at is in the early universe, you can go back to a time where the average density in the universe was what the Earth compressed into this volume would be. The universe is expanding quite rapidly then, but that is, uh, uh, you could go back to a time where the density was, uh, uh, if you had a region of this size at that time that was over dense by a factor of two or so, that region could collapse uh, to a black hole right then and there in the early universe. So it, it does provide a mechanism to give you black holes of mass much less than a solar mass, uh, but uh, there's no theoretical reason to believe you would have such large overdensities over such uh, scales. Uh, and as I say, there's no evidence for primordial black holes, but this is an interesting possibility to keep in mind. Okay, so now let me tell you about what black holes are. And first, let me show you what a black hole looks like. That's what a black hole looks like. That's with no matter around in the Event Horizon Telescope picture. You see stuff, but that's because you've got matter around the black hole. You know, the black hole is right here in this diagram, and there's a black background around it. So you're not going to learn too much by trying to get a, a usual spatial image of a black hole. Uh, so if you want to know what a black hole looks like, what you really need to be thinking about and what I'm drawing for you here is a space-time diagram that illustrates gravitational collapse uh, to a black hole. So in a space-time diagram, I'm illustrate forward in time as going upward in the diagram, although you really, as I'll explain further, have to look at the light cones to see where time is going upward uh, in a more literal sense. And spatial directions are displayed horizontally, and I'm displaying two spatial dimensions using perspective. Uh, I don't know of any way of 
uh, you know, displaying three spatial dimensions and one time direction on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So a space-time diagram is, is displaying a history of events. Uh, and I, as I say, I'm showing the gravitational collapse of a star. So this semicircle here at the very bottom is the outer surface of a star or some other body at this early time when it's just beginning to undergo gravitational collapse. And as we go forward in time, the surface of this body collapses down. Nothing stops the collapse. It collapses down to zero size uh, here at r equals zero and produces a singularity that persists forever that I've illustrated with this sort of jaggedy purple uh, line here. So that's, and all of the matter in the star falls into this singularity. So that's what happens in gravitational collapse. And how can you tell that there's a black hole here and so on? Well, you can only tell that because I've drawn in some light cones. So a light cone is the trajectory in space-time that you'd make if, well, or a flash of light would make if you could imagine that I just lit up a flash of light at one point for a second. Well, that light will expand out at the speed of light, but of course it goes forward in time as well, so it traces out a cone in a space-time diagram. Any, so all light rays travel along this cone. Any observers have to travel or material bodies of any sort have to travel within the cone. So out here where you're reasonably far from where the collapse took place, uh, there's no problem with light making it out to infinity and an observer with an appropriate, possibly with an appropriate rocket ship making it out to infinity. But as you get close to the singularity produced by the collapse, these light cones tip over in the manner that I've shown. And over, if you have the misfortune to be over here at this event, close to the singularity, the whole light cone is tipped over. Any light that you emit, even if you emit it radially outward, or the best you can do for radially outward, will in fact fall in uh, to the singularity. Uh, no better for the ones that aren't directed outward, and you yourself are going to, since you can't travel faster than light, are going to fall within this singularity. So this region in here is a black hole. It's a region of no escape, and in fact, everything in the black hole will have to fall into the singularity that was produced by the collapse. The boundary of the black hole is known as the event horizon, and it's uh, the sur a surface at which the light cones would be tangents. So an observer right at the, for the radially outward moving one, so an observer would still fall into the black hole, but a light ray could travel along the event horizon in principle and not fall into the singularity. Once you're outside the event horizon, then you can at least in principle escape uh, to the singularity. So the event horizon of the black hole is given, the, the radius of the event horizon is given by the same formula that Mitchell and Laplace uh, derived. So a black hole of, if, of course, the sun won't collapse, but if you were to have a one solar mass black hole produced by collapse, uh, which you won't have, but you'll have three, four solar mass ones, uh, it's, the so, its radius will just be uh, three kilometers uh, times the mass of the object divided by the mass of the sun. So a black hole of a solar mass would be a very small object, just three kilometers in size. So the picture I've given you of the singularity is with the light cone sort of tipped over toward it, it can be, well, the, the sort of time structure is kind of distorted here with these 
tipped light cones. And it's useful, and I'm, I'll just briefly do this, to redraw exactly this same diagram, but draw, redraw it so the light cones are straightened out. Uh, I have to suppress the angular direction, so this is just a sort of radius versus time here. The important things I just wanted, so I have the same collapsing matter that collapses to a singularity, but in this diagram you can see a little more clearly that the event horizon is a null surface, it's the path of a light ray. Uh, and the singularity is really an end of time kind of singularity rather than a uh, kind of point of space existing for all time singularity. So if you fall, if you find yourself in the black hole, then just moving forward in time, uh, you can see you're going to reach this singularity. One of the things this diagram does uh, well is sort of, we, this is the picture of what, of what you'd get in classical general relativity. We certainly expect quantum effects will become a, uh, important when the curvature gets sufficiently high, but this curvature will get sufficiently high only very near this singularity. That should not have any effect since it's forward in time from where these people are or even where these people who've fallen into the black hole might be, uh, that shouldn't affect anything that an observer would experience outside the black hole. So quantum gravity effects should not affect, uh, even though we're dealing with a singularity, the, the predictions of classical general relativity should be reliable. Okay, so now let me really get on to the main subject of the talk of black holes and thermodynamics and mention that there is an, an analogy that one can draw between laws of black hole physics and laws of thermodynamics. Now, on first sight, one would think that these would have maybe even less, these subjects would have even less to do with each other than if you opened up an encyclopedia of physics randomly to two pages and pick two things, uh, you know, they'd be more likely to have more of a relationship to each other from what I've said so far than these two things. But I'm going to make now an argument that, well, will be somewhat artificial and weak at first, or artificial sounding, it's not artificial, but it, it may sound that way uh, uh, and certainly may sound weak, but as you'll see, it will get stronger and stronger and make, I think, well, an absolutely remarkable subject that certainly has occupied a good fraction of my own research career. So first of all, there's an analogy between a stationary black hole uh, and a body in thermal equilibrium. So, for a body in thermal equilibrium, well, you, you could imagine you have some box that you, in thermodynamics or statistical <laughs> physics, that you fill up with gas in a sloppy way. And initially, the gas is dynamical and out of equilibrium. But if you let the gas sit there long enough, and, and, and it'll have very complicated dynamics initially, but if you let, there, let it sit there long enough, it will reach thermal equilibrium where its macroscopic state will be completely characterized by a few parameters. In the case of a gas, the energy, the volume, and the total number of particles is really all you need to, to characterize the properties of the state. Well, if you form a black hole by gravitational collapse, one would expect that black hole is going to, in fact, rather quickly settle down to a stationary final state. Uh, in the late 1960s uh, through the early 70s, uh, quite a bit of work in classical general relativity proved that stationary black holes were in fact uniquely characterized by just a few parameters, specifically the total mass of the black hole, 
the total angular momentum of the black hole, and if you allow charge and electromagnetic fields, the total electric charge of the black hole. So again, the thermal equilibrium and stationary final state with a few state parameters, well, if that was all I had to say, I wouldn't really try to even make this much of an analogy, but that is an analogy. Okay, in thermodynamics, uh, once you have a body that's locally in equilibrium, uh, you can define a notion of the temperature. And in order for the body to be globally in thermal equilibrium, the zeroth law of thermodynamics says that the temperature has to be uniform. Okay, in the case of a stationary black hole, it's similarly possible, again, stationary is sort of like locally in equilibrium, it's similarly possible to define a notion of surface gravity. So since this will come up uh, again in what I'm gonna say further, I mean, in elementary physics courses, I'll use my pen rather than something more delicate, uh, one normally defines the surface gravity of, say, the surface of the Earth, which we are on now, as the acceleration that an object will, would undergo if freely falling toward the Earth. That's what uh, one teaches in freshman physics. Well, in general relativity, uh, it's really the freely falling pen here that's not accelerating, but you could define an equivalent notion of surface gravity in terms of the, accelerate, the local acceleration that this pen would have to undergo or more uh, uh, precise, I mean, since I, uh, I have an appropriately defined acceleration in this local sense, the force per unit mass that I'd have to exert on the pen in order to hold it stationary. For if we go to the surface of a black hole and I am somehow standing near the surface with a very powerful rocket ship and I'm holding this pen up, the surface gravity defined that way would actually be infinite. But if I, reflective of the fact that if we actually get to the horizon, I can't hold the pen up or it would take infinite force to hold the pen up. Uh, but if I multiply that uh, force or that acceleration uh, by the so-called redshift factor, the factor by which a signal from near the black hole would get sent out to a large distance would get redshifted. Uh, the gravitational redshift will cause signals to decrease in frequency. The redshift factor goes to zero. The product of this acceleration and the redshift factor goes to a finite limit. And that's the definition of the surface gravity. And a theorem that one can prove in general relativity is that the surface gravity has to be constant over the horizon of a stationary black hole. So an analog in some sense, although I don't think I should be convincing anyone who, uh, you know, yet of there being an analogy here other than a few, a couple of random things. Okay, but now the analogy really gets strong when we consider the first and second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so the first law of thermodynamics can be formulated as saying that if I have a body in thermal equilibrium and I perturb it, add energy, change the volume, uh, whatever, uh, the change in the energy and the other state parameters, I, I could have included the number of particles here too, uh, with a chemical potential type term, uh, those are related to, well, a quantity called the entropy of the body uh, by this uh, sort of relationship. Well, it was proven in the early 70s that an exactly similar law uh, holds for black holes. Uh, if we 
perturb a stationary black hole, uh, maybe we add some charge or angular momentum or just give it some energy, we change its state parameters, the changes in the state parameters are related to the surface gravity of the black hole times the change in the surface area of the event horizon of the black hole. So the event horizon of a black hole is an ordinary two-dimensional surface. The event horizon at a given time is an ordinary two-dimensional surface. It has an area, and that's what comes in uh, to this formulation. So here is the angular velocity of the horizon of the black hole, and here is the electrostatic potential of the black hole. Uh, the exact form of these terms are not important, but these are sort of work terms analogous to the PDV term that you'd have in thermodynamics. In fact, if I considered the thermodynamics of a rotating and charged body, I would get exactly terms of this sort with the change in angular, angular velocity times change in angular momentum of the body and electrostatic potential of the body times change of charge of the body occurring in this ordinary first law. So these really are remarkable mathematical analogs of each other. Uh, there's even, uh, so now we're really getting somewhere, but now there's an even more remarkable analogy, namely the second law of thermodynamics says that this entropy quantity that appears in the first law never decreases with time. Uh, you can do processes that keep the system in equilibrium that maybe don't change the total entropy. That's the entropy of, I mean, you have to be talking about an isolated system or a complete system that includes the entropy of one subsystem may go down, but at the expense of the entropy of the rest of the system going up even more. Uh, and in the early 70s, Hawking proved a remarkable area theorem for black holes that says that the surface area of the event horizon of a black hole never decreases with time. So if you throw things into a black hole or do any other uh, uh, classically allowed process with a black hole, you'll always end up with a, a black hole of a larger surface area. You might think, well, why we also, how can we decrease the mass of a black hole? Well, it was already known that there are, for a rotating or charged black hole, you can do processes that would decrease the energy of the black hole, uh, but you can't decrease the area. Okay, so let's look at the analogous quantities in these laws. We've got energy and mass. We've got entropy and area. The work terms I'm not too much uh, uh, concerned with making an analogy on because those would be exactly analogous. And we have temperature and surface gravity. But there's already a hint in classical black hole physics uh, that this might be more than a mathematical analogy. There might be some physics behind it because mass and energy really are the same thing in relativity theory. So that suggests maybe uh, we should identify surface gravity and temperature. I've chosen a particular numerical factor. Uh, you know, I can divide this one over eight pi. I wouldn't know how from classical physics to divide that between the surface gravity and the area. I've chosen a particular uh, way here for good reason. Uh, but that's where the analogy would appear to, have ended, appear to end. And indeed, you know, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking wrote an interesting paper, a, a marvelous paper in the early 70s where they proved this first law of black hole mechanics and other uh, results, and they said this obviously was just an analogy, essentially because the, the physical temperature of a black hole is clearly absolute zero. Black holes don't radiate. Nothing can escape from a black hole. Uh, um, 
Okay, well that's where Hawking's 1974 discovery uh, really made this uh, subject from into one which might have seemed far-fetched into one where there's clearly a tremendous amount of deep physics behind it. So what Hawking showed is that there will be particle creation effects near a black hole. And as a result of particle creation, a distant observer will observe a flux of particles that appear to come from the black hole. Now they don't really come from the black hole. Nothing can come from the black hole. But these are really particles created outside the black hole that manage to escape to infinity. But it looks to an observer at infinity like a black hole is radiating at a temperature that is proportional to the surface gravity of the black hole. That temperature is extremely small for a solar mass black hole the temperature would only be 10 to the minus seventh degrees Kelvin for a black hole, big black hole at the center of a galaxy, it's even lower. Uh, it would only be for primordial black holes of very small mass that this would be an important effect. But in principle, it's a very important effect and in fact it has uh, great importance uh, for the fate of the black hole itself. Because if you imagine having an isolated black hole, I mean, black holes in our universe, first of all, are, right now we have cosmic microwave background radiation, even if we're far away from everything else, that's at three degrees Kelvin, which is much warmer than 10 to the minus seventh degrees Kelvin. So a black hole in the present universe would, wherever it is, is going to be absorbing radiation rather than radiating mass. But if you imagine a perfectly isolated black hole, and if you wait long enough in our universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation will redshift away and uh, black holes will behave in this way. Uh, the mass loss of a black hole is given, because it's thermal radiation, by the Stefan-Boltzmann law. The temperature is inversely proportional to the mass. The area is proportional to the mass squared, which means that the smaller the black hole, the more rapidly it loses mass. If you integrate this equation, you'll see that a black hole should evaporate completely if it's in perfect isolation in a finite amount of time. That finite amount of time is a really, really long time for a solar mass black hole, about 10 to the 73 seconds. But if you had a primordial black hole produced in the early universe of just 10 to the 15th grams, uh, that black hole would be evaporating right now. Uh, this would be roughly 10 billion years, age of universe. Uh, we don't see any such black holes evaporating or any evidence uh, for them in gamma ray background, et cetera, which would put an upper limit on how many such primordial black holes there could be. But as a matter of principle, black holes are not perfectly stable objects. They will literally evaporate uh, if isolated in a finite amount of time. Okay, so where does this leave us on the laws of black holes and thermodynamics? Well, we had all these analogous laws, but now with my choice of one over two pi, I've, I've set in these formulas here, g, g the gravitational constant, c the speed of light, and h bar equal to one, as well as Boltzmann's constant equal to one. Uh, uh, but surface gravity over 2 pi really is the temperature of a black hole in a thermodynamic sense. So that suggests uh, that area of a black hole maybe should be thought of as entropy. Well, is there reason to think that is the case? Uh, well, there is really 
good reason to think so, and part of these reasons predated even Hawking's uh, particle creation calculation. But there are problems with both the ordinary second law and with the classical black hole area theorem. So what possible problem could there be to the ordinary second law that's survived, you know, intact the entire 20th, 20th century revolutions of physics without really any significant change? Uh, you know, this seems to be one of the most stable laws in physics. But if you have a black hole present, there is a problem with this uh, law if you take the view that we really should only consider matter outside the black hole. If we take some matter and drop it into the black hole, that matter will fall into the singularity and disappear from the universe. And certainly, will, once it crosses into the black hole, disappear from the universe that we can observe if we stay outside the black hole. So the ordinary second law certainly can't be satisfied in a meaningful observational sense uh, unless we only count the matter outside black holes. But if we only count matter outside black holes, the entropy of can be made to decrease. So there is a problem with the ordinary second law of thermodynamics when you have a black hole. When the, uh, well, there's no, the area theorem is a theorem. And in classical physics, there is no problem with the area of a black hole never decreasing with time. But when the Hawking process is taken into account, there is also a problem with the area theorem. Uh, because, well, I even said that a black hole would evaporate within a finite amount of time, disappear completely. The area of a black hole, while it's Hawking radiating, uh, does in fact decrease. How is that uh, possible since we have a theorem here? Well, this theorem assumes that the locally measured energy density of matter is positive. A completely reasonable thing and standard thing to assume in classical physics. But in quantum field theory, it's easy to make regions of space and time where the energy density of quantum fields is negative. Uh, and in the Hawking process, there is, a, in fact, a negative flux of energy into the black hole. So everything proceeds causally, but the black hole absorbs negative energy from the quantum field, and it's air, that violates the hypothesis of the area theorem, and the area of a black hole uh, decreases. So, how can one get around this? Well, that's where Bekenstein's idea that, as I said, was proposed, well, while we were in Princeton and uh, before Hawking's, uh, uh, the, the problem with the area theorem uh, also came to, four, to, the, to the fore. But these problems are just completely resolved if we give up on there being a separate ordinary second law and a separate area theorem and just consider a quantity that Bekenstein named the generalized entropy, which is given by the sum of the entropy of matter outside of black holes and the area of the uh, of the black hole. This coefficient is fixed by the Hawking temperature to be one quarter. Bekenstein had an argument that it should be of order unity in the Planckian units. Uh, he, in fact, guessed something like log two as a possibility uh, for what it would be. But the idea uh, uh, that one should define a generalized entropy uh, uh, was what we celebrated here in the 
conference eight years ago and, and what deserves to be continued to be celebrated uh, as, as we uh, continue on. So what is the idea uh, behind this? Well, of course, when Bekenstein did the work, it was this problem with the ordinary second law that was uh, at the fore. And now the idea is if you take some matter and throw it into the black hole, you will indeed decrease the entropy of matter outside black holes, but you'll do that at the expense of increasing the area of a black hole. Uh, and in ordinary units, uh, you can see that this coefficient is absolutely enormous, so you don't have to increase the area of the black hole very much to compensate for the loss of entropy of matter that you've uh, thrown in. On the other hand, as I said, in the Hawking effect, uh, you decrease the area of the black hole. And that has, with this coefficient, a big effect on decreasing the generalized entropy. But in the Hawking effect, you decrease the area at the expense of spewing out a thermal distribution of matter that has extremely high entropy uh, for the energy that is being spewed out. Uh, and the entropy of matter that's created outside the black hole uh, is sufficient. If, if the black hole is isolated, it's a little bit more than sufficient. If, if you hold it in a box, it's exactly sufficient to compensate uh, for the loss of area. So if you do a careful analysis of all ways of trying to violate Bekenstein's generalized second law, you end up, I claim, much the same way as when people try to get counterexamples to violating the ordinary second law, realize that it always fails and it always just barely fails. Uh, you know, you can maintain it, uh, equality, if you do it just right. Uh, so this has exactly the smell of the ordinary second law of thermodynamics. And that would be the obvious interpretation of what's going on here. That, the, that Bekenstein's generalized entropy is really the total entropy of the universe, which has a contribution from, here from the black hole or black holes, and here from the matter outside black holes. And you add them up, and you get the total entropy, generalized entropy, but really the total entropy. And that satisfies a single second law. So, Going back to the analogous quantities, this apparent validity of the generalized second law gives a clear suggestion that a quarter area really is the physical entropy of a black hole. So that's what I'm concluding with, because I think we still have a long way to go to understand the origin of the entropy of black holes. The, the microscopic kind of origin of entropy of black holes. Uh, but what I hope I've convinced you of is that the study of black holes has really led to a remarkable and very deep connection between gravity, quantum theory, and thermodynamics. And it's my hope and also very much my expect expectation that uh, we're going to get more uh, fundamental insights into this with further study. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for coming here to deliver this talk. And now, let's see if I get this right. Yes, questions please, Nadal. First of all, thank you very much for coming to honor uh, Jacob, who was uh, uh, a good friend and an especially good teacher. And this was a wonderful uh, pedagogical lecture in his memory. Uh, I want to mention also and thank uh, the Beckenstein family who uh, granted us uh, uh, Jacob's uh, lecture notes.
which are now available on the uh, Israeli Physical Society website as a, an example of excellent uh, teaching uh, resource uh, for, for all to see. Um, I, I have a question about the cosmic censorship uh, principle mm -hmm. you mentioned. If the uh, black hole is spinning fast enough, or naively, it should become exposed, right? When the spin parameter well, is if larger than one, it should become exposed. There's no, there's no additional physics that should stop it, right? Yeah. So there is an exact solution, the Kerr solution for a rotating black hole. That allows any parameters you want of the mass and angular momentum. And if you choose the angular momentum to be sufficiently large, you'll get the solution will describe a naked singularity, as it's called, rather than a black hole, the, the singularity. OK, but the question is, how do you produce uh, that singularity from gravitational collapse? So you have to be starting with some condition like a star, a rotating star, it could be very rapidly rotating, uh, whatever you want, and get it to collapse to this perhaps Kerr solution with angular momentum too large. If you just look at that naively, but also if you look at it much, in much more detail, if something is rotating that rapidly, it won't collapse. The centripetal, centrifugal repulsion will dominate the gravitational attraction. You can work this out in more detail with, in the charge case. It's a lot simpler because you can restrict to spherically symmetric. You have exactly the same problem. If the black hole has charge larger than mass in units where G and C equals 1, it'll be a naked singularity. But you can work out what happens to a collapsing shell you know, if it has a large enough charge uh, that it would have produced a naked singularity. And you'll find that the shell collapses. You can make it collapse, but eventually it will turn around and expand back out. It won't ever create this naked singularity. You, if, with the appropriate choice of parameters, that you can make a black, it, it will make a charged black hole, but it won't make a naked singularity. So these kinds of examples, which have been looked at, uh, uh, you know, very much support cosmic censorship. OK, so I, when I was talking about the Hawking evaporation, I was emphasizing isolated because it, it would otherwise, the, the Hawking radiation for solar mass or larger black holes is so tiny that it would be dominated by cosmic microwave background or so on. Uh, really, the, the theory of black holes should apply, you know, aside from Hawking radiation, which is this tiny effect, the black holes for all intents and purposes, are isolated. Even, even the M87 black hole that I showed, even with all that glowing matter around it, the matter is so, you know, has so little mass compared to the black hole that it's making only a really tiny perturbation of the black hole that, for all, all intents and purposes, could be neglected, and the black hole itself could be treated as, as isolated as far as properties are concerned. Uh, sorry, my views on the microscopic origin of the entropy of black holes. Uh, oh, and the information problem. OK, yeah. Uh, on the microscopic origin, uh, I've largely come to the conclusion that I don't see how it could be degrees of freedom. I mean, so it's a question of what degrees of freedom of the black hole are responsible for its entropy, I, I think is really the, the relevant question. And where do those degrees of freedom reside? Uh, and I'm pretty much convinced that it doesn't make sense that they would reside inside the black hole. And I'm pretty convinced that it 
doesn't make sense that it would re they would reside on the event horizon itself. And I'm pretty convinced that it doesn't make sense that they would reside just outside the black hole. And so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> as far as the information issue, that, I mean, that you know, could be the subject of another half colloquium or whatever. Uh, uh, but I, my view uh, is that, uh, that most likely information is lost into a black hole in the process of, so uh, l let me just explain this in two sentences for people who aren't already familiar with it. So it, I, I've shown you the space-time diagram of gravitational collapse to a black hole. You then have Hawking radiation and the black hole eventually evaporates. But the Hawking radiation is thermal and is in a mixed state. In the calculations, the Hawking radiation is in, entangled with uh, excitations that are within the black hole. Uh, so at least naively, when the black hole has completed its evaporation, you end up, you might have started with a pure quantum state, you end up with a mixed quantum state. And I believe that is what happens. The alternatives to that, I don't see any problem with that. And the alternatives to that are, to say the least, highly problematic. Uh, there's a review that I wrote with Bill Unruh a couple of years ago that would be you know, by far the best summary of our views on it. I think Bill Unruh and I are, you know, I, I might be able to think of another half dozen people or so who work in the field who would ag agree or sort of agree with us. The vast majority of the, com of the community, I mean, particularly the string particle community where it, 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 there's almost unanimity there, uh, you know, feels that loss of information is a complete disaster and it couldn't happen and they'd be willing to take firewalls or fuzz balls or all sorts of other things that violate the ordinary laws of physics in order to preserve that, but. Okay, so I'd like to relegate any other questions to personal discussion after the talk. Professor Wall will yeah. be here yeah. today and tomorrow, just a minute. So please, I would like to thank uh, our speakers.